gentlemen, good morning. And for those in the US, good evening. Thank you for joining today's exclusive live webinar on pitfalls in a post-pandemic world, deglobalization and asymmetrical normalization. My name is Serena. I'm from the Public Policy Institute at our Hong Kong Foundation and your MC today. On behalf of our Hong Kong Foundation, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all guests, members of our Hong Kong Foundation, friends from the media, and members of the public join us now. Today, we're honored and delighted to have Professor Stephen Roach speaking to us live from the US. Professor Roach is a senior fellow at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs and a good friend of Hong Kong and the foundation, as he had been the former chairman of Morgan Stanley Asia, based in the city. Without further ado, may I invite Professor Roach to share with us his thoughts on several observations and challenges in the post-pandemic world. Professor Roach, please. Thank you very much, Serena. It is a pleasure to be with you um, uh, today. I've been a big supporter of our Hong Kong Foundation and it's a particular pleasure to present my views to you uh, in this um, uh, timely and important uh, insight forum. Uh, there's a lot of cross currents at work in the world today uh, from Asia to the United States. And we can't hope, uh, help, but, um, or we can't hope to cover all of them in the time that we have um, in, in this meeting. But I thought I would try to address some of the important um, forces shaping uh, the um, economic response uh, to this pandemic uh, in terms of the, the downturn in the world economy, and then the, the consequences that has for the recovery that we can expect. And I'll use a series of slides to illustrate um, my uh, approach to this um, daunting task. So I'd like to just start out with um, setting the stage um, uh, and give you a sense of what the world looked like before the pandemic hit. Uh, on the left are, uh, is a slide showing annual growth rates of the world GDP uh, beginning in the year 2000 and going through uh, 2021 with projections for 2020 and 2021 uh, provided by the International Monetary Fund in their um, uh, update uh, pre-pandemic of January of 2020. And so a few things to note about this slide because I'll rely on this uh, as we go through it. Uh, the vertical bars are just the annual growth rates in world GDP. There are two horizontal dash lines. The first one shows you the trend growth uh, in the world economy, which over the past 40 years has averaged 3.5%. And then the second horizontal line, the, the dashed red line, uh, is uh, drawn at two and a half percent. Anything below that, we typically um, consider to be uh, a global recession. So pre-pandemic, the IMF had lowered its estimate for 2019 to 2.4%. To me, this was a big warning sign because it pointed to a world that was um, uh, only, uh, um, excuse me, they, they lowered their number to 2.9%. It was only four tenths of a point above the official global recession threshold of two and a half percent. That was a worrisome development because it was not only the weakest year since the global financial crisis, of um, 08, 08 and 09, but it was only a thin margin away uh, from the two and a half percent threshold. So I wrote about this um, in early pre-pandemic 2020, and I said that the world was too close to that recession threshold, uh, and should there be a shock, uh, 
we could easily go into recession. I also noted that the world economy uh, for a number of years has been heavily dependent on China. And so any accident in China would have dire consequences uh, for the world. And of course, uh, I had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, but uh, when uh, China began its lockdown uh, at the end of January, it became quickly evident to me that that was the tipping point that was going to make my concerns come to pass. And that's exactly what happened. You can see this now, um, same chart, longer time period, but now reflecting uh, the, um, uh, the latest uh, forecast of the IMF that was just released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we've gone from 2.9%, uh, the orange vertical bar again in 2019, to an IMF uh, estimate of a minus 4.9% drop in world GDP um, this year. We've never seen anything close to that. The worst we've ever seen prior to that was in 2009, when um, the world output, according to the IMF, contracted by only one-tenth of a percent. I've added one more line in here just to give you a sense of how severe this downturn is, and that shows you the deviations of the blue bars from the, um, uh, the, the trend growth, 3.5%. So we're subtracting um, global output from its long-term trend. And that's the best way to judge the severity of any uh, uh, recession, because the world on average expands by about 3.5% a year. So you can see in uh, 2009, during the global financial crisis, labeled a GFC, uh, the slight contraction was actually a big miss relative to the trend. It was 36 percentage points below the trend. Uh, and now uh, the IMF is projecting uh, this minus 4.9% for 2020, which is a massive 8.4 percentage points uh, below uh, the trend. And so that is a, um, uh, a very serious uh, problem. Uh, and uh, one that is a a deviation from trend uh, nearly three times that which we experienced in the GFC. I would note that the IMF has you know, recovery penciled in for 2021, the green vertical bar plus 5.4%. That sounds like a big number, but compared to the trend, it's only 1.9 percentage points above the trend. So following uh, a shortfall from trend of 8.4, we are only recouping a small portion of the uh, foregone uh, uh, growth. Uh, now, uh, the next slide shows you the debate that we're having over economic recovery. And there's lots of different uh, uh, patterns that we can focus on, but I've chosen to focus on three of the most popular. Uh, the, the one that will be over quickly and we'll forget about this um, uh, in a very short period of time, the great V-shaped recovery. Uh, the one in the middle is the U-shaped where you go down hard and you uh, stay at a depressed level for a while before resuming uh, uh, economic recovery. And then there's the worst of them all, uh, the L-shaped where you go down in a sharp recession and you don't recover very much at all. Uh, and that is a, a more of a Japanese style uh, lost decade or multiple decade syndrome. I put down uh, some characteristics of each of these um, uh, patterns of recovery that you should keep in mind. Um, and I would just say at the outset, for the V-shape, you really need to uh, bring COVID under control very quickly, uh, and then uh, things will snap back, uh, hence the, the notion of the rubber band. And with policy uh, having provided so much stimulus, the big bazooka will have a very powerful 
uh, recovery. Uh, and uh, both the supply and the demand side uh, of the affected economies will respond. The U-shape, it's gonna take longer to control the virus. Uh, and uh, uh, while there may be some early signs of uh, normalizing uh, the supply or production side, uh, the, the demand side is going to uh, be slower to come around. So the normalization is asymmetrical. And then um, for the L-shape, um, you, you bring back um, economic activity too quickly. You have a relapse in the virus, uh, and that leads to a much more severe and lasting behavioral cap capitulation by consumers and uh, even uh, companies. So which one will it be? Um, the, um, the best way to try to understand the dynamic here is to look at uh, uh, some modeling that was done uh, by uh, Richard Baldwin in an article that he published uh, in uh, March of this year uh, on the trade-off between uh, the infection curve and the business cycle. And on the left, you see, uh, you know, a simple illustration uh, of the modeling that he developed. The red line on the top uh, shows you uh, what happens to uh, new COVID cases without any lockdown or containment uh, policies. And, you know, the, the, the new case curve spikes up dramatically. Uh, and then um, uh, through some miraculous um, uh, process uh, comes down. Uh, and because there's no lockdown, uh, the recession, while it's a severe one, is not nearly as bad as the, uh, the blue line on the bottom, where there is a lockdown to limit the increase uh, of infections. Uh, and I would just point out that, um, you know, this notion of a relapse uh, everybody thinks there's going to be, you know, a second wave and possibly a third wave. It's not something that is really, um, that comes out of thin air. Uh, on the right, you actually see um, the uh, mortality rate from the uh, influenza, uh, of the Spanish flu of 1918 and 1919. This is UK data where there were three waves of infection uh, and the worst of the mortality, unfortunately, came uh, in the second wave. So this trade-off between um, uh, containment or lockdowns uh, in infections needs to be taken very, very seriously. Now, what does the data show right now about the nature of the response? Uh, here we compare China and the United States. Um, China, obviously, the first uh, to be hit. Uh, and uh, th in both cases, the um, production response is measured by purchasing managers indexes, PMI, has been very rapid. Uh, and uh, uh, as China was hit first, it responded first. And the U.S. production response has also been uh, quite rapid. <clears throat> but... Um, in both cases, there are lags on the demand side. Uh, consumer spending increased sharply uh, in the U.S. Uh, and in China uh, in the months of, uh, uh, of uh, April and May. But in both cases, uh, the spending level, while it's risen sharply, has recouped only a little bit more uh, than one third of that which was lost during the lockdown. So I would conclude here that um, the normalization that's occurred thus far has been asymmetrical, more on the supply side than on the demand side. Maybe that'll change, time will tell. Um, this is a very complicated slide, so I will uh, be brief on it. But I think to understand the, um, uh, the asymmet asymmetry between supply and demand, you need to look very carefully uh, at a detailed um, breakdown of the employment adjustments that are, are occurring in uh, economies around the world. And this is a very detailed breakdown of the U.S. employment 
uh, since uh, the COVID uh, uh, crisis hit. And we basically break down uh, employment into three groups of industries. Essential industries that need to stay open, like grocery stores, pharmacies, gas stations, uh, and utilities, and a few others. The face-to-face -face services industries, largely, uh, where um, uh, the bulk of the employment adjustments have occurred, restaurants, hotels, uh, retail trade, arts, entertainment, recreation. Uh, these account for about 55% of total uh, pre-COVID employment in the United States. And then there are the so-called remote industries where courtesy of technologies like I'm speaking with you on today, uh, you can keep the, the flow going and just relocate uh, your employees to their homes or other safe uh, modes of, uh, of, of a work environment. And what happened was when the labor market collapsed in February and especially April in the United States, um, we lost 21 million private jobs in two months. We've never seen anything close to that. Uh, and the bulk of it, as the pie chart shows you on the right, was in the face-to-face service industries where 81% of the job loss occurred uh, and much smaller declines in essential industries and remote industries. I show you on the right the healing ratio, how much of the loss has been recouped in the last couple of months. And on balance, somewhere between 37 and 41% of the uh, jobs that have been lost have been recouped, which is, you know, good news for those who are working again, but still raises serious questions about how, how much further we need to go, especially in these areas where social distancing is likely to produce uh, dramatic and lasting structural change. Uh, there's been some interesting research that describes the uh, uh, the impact of uh, earlier pandemics. This is a study that was produced again just a few months ago by some economists at the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of San Francisco and the University of California in Davis. And they looked at the impacts of, of 12 large pandemics going back to the Black Death of the 14th century uh, and to qualify um, these serious pandemics, each um, had a job loss of, um, uh, excuse me, a, uh, a death rate of, of more than 100,000 uh, in terms of uh, mortality. And as you can see, the, the blue line at the bottom uh, shows that the impact of these major pandemics has a long shadow. Uh, the impact lasts for a long, long time. And so based on earlier pandemics, um, you know, that in and of itself uh, casts doubt on this optimistic call for a V-shaped uh, recovery. Uh, it is associated with lower interest rates, uh, which would allow uh, fiscal authorities to provide more stimulus to respond. So um, my vote is for... Um, uh, uh, an asymmetrical normalization that gives us um, uh, an outcome that is, while it may seem like a V right now, uh, that is not a sustainable outcome. I would look actually for the letter that I haven't shown you uh, thus far. It would be a W, one that we would associate with a double dip. The rebound that we're experiencing right now will be followed by another uh, downturn uh, in the economy. This raises a lot of questions about um, the global environment if, if that were to occur. And I've listed some of the issues at the bottom that I want to briefly <laughs> take you through. Decoupling, deglobalization, uh, trade diversion, uh, and then finally, the outlook for the U.S. dollar. Um, I can see I've already spoken too long, so I'm going to uh, go try to pick up the pace uh, a little bit more. Uh, the deglobalization debate is very important. Uh, globalization, of course, has been the uh, uh, overarching force uh, that has been 
uh, it describes the integration of the world economy over the past uh, 25 years. Uh, and there are many that fear that uh, globalization is coming to an end. Uh, I'm not certain that's true. Uh, and I'm hopeful that um, uh, what we're seeing right now is only a temporary uh, uh, pause uh, in the integration of, of the world. But make no mistake about it, there are a lot of, um, uh, of uh, politicians in particular, especially in the United States, uh, pushing against uh, the offshoring uh, of, uh, of, of globalization uh, and arguing that we need to bring business back home. Now, if that were to occur, I think um, uh, that would be a problem for businesses and consumers alike. And of course, right now, the bulk of the focus for deglobalization uh, has been directed at uh, America's largest um, uh, piece of our uh, uh, big trade deficit, uh, China. Uh, the point of this slide is to illustrate that while the Chinese piece of our trade deficit, the red bars at the bottom of this slide, has come down in large part a reflection of um, uh, the, the trade war and the tariffs that uh, President Trump has placed on China, that um, uh, the, the Chinese piece of our uh, multilateral trade deficit has come down much more than the trade deficit itself. And that means that our deficit with other countries has expanded uh, more sharply uh, as a result. And hence, trade has been diverted uh, from China, our low cost supplier to higher cost uh, uh, sources of, of trade, uh, in particular, Mexico, Vietnam, Canada, Switzerland, uh, and Ireland. We have a multilateral trade problem that you cannot address uh, with a bilateral uh, attempt uh, to narrow uh, the issue. So uh, I think that's a very important point. Secondly, so much of our trade growth now occurs through uh, global value chains, GVCs. Uh, in fact, uh, a study from the IMF recently suggested that uh, increased GVC activity accounted for nearly 75% of the total increase in global trade over the 20 year period 1993 to 2013. Uh, other research has indicated that it takes a long period of time to construct these um, uh, value chains and you don't uh, simply move from one value chain to another, one component uh, uh, of sourcing uh, to another quickly. It takes a long time to alter these so-called sticky uh, supply chains. And so the notion that we can just push a button and go from offshoring through GBCs to reshoring, uh, I think is actually uh, uh, ludicrous. Now, <clears throat> recently there's been some discussion about what all of this means uh, for currency markets. And I've taken a pretty strong view that uh, in this uh, post-COVID world, uh, one of the big surprises is going to be a very sharp decline in the value of the US dollar. And I make my um, uh, uh, analysis on the basis of two considerations. One, um, the the link between our domestic savings rate uh, and our current account deficit, and two, the uh, fact that America is squandering uh, its global leadership role on multiple fronts. I would just point out, as this slide shows you, that the dollar has been um, uh, very strong uh, since July of 2011. It's risen by about a third on a broad trade weighted basis uh, over that, that period. I would also point out that <laughs> this um, strength in the dollar uh, has occurred at a time when our uh, domestic savings rate pre COVID was extremely low. Uh, the domestic savings rate, which includes the saving of businesses uh, 
households in the government sector, shown on net terms adjusted for depreciation, was only 1.4% in the first quarter of 2020 pre-COVID. That is one-fifth the 7% average uh, over the 45-year period from 1960 to, to, 20, to 2005. That's the way it was before COVID hit. Now, this domestic savings rate, which is so low, is going to go sharply in the negative territory, uh, courtesy of exploding government budget deficits, which will average 14% of GDP uh, this year and next. And that means that our uh, domestic savings rate is going to go sharply negative uh, over the next few years, and we will have a record uh, current account uh, deficit uh, as a result. And so I look for the dollar to drop by 35% on a broad trade weighted basis uh, over the next few years uh, uh, in a way to um, uh, facilitate uh, the current account uh, adjustment. 35% sounds like a big number. Um, we've had this uh, comparable drops before. Uh, in the 1970s, the broad trade weighted index dropped 33%. In the mid 80s, in a very short period of time, it also dropped 33%. Uh, and in the early 2000s, we had a comparable uh, 28% drop. People ask me immediately, if you think the dollar is going down, how could it ever go up against any other currency? Uh, this is the so-called TINA defense. There is no alternative, TINA. Uh, and I think that is a, uh, 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 really the, the wrong uh, response. I look for the dollar to go up uh, against two major currencies, the euro uh, and uh, uh, the renminbi. Uh, and I think that um, the euro uh, is clearly the most unloved major currency in the world. Uh, it's, it's down about 15% on a broad trade weighted basis over the last 10 years. Uh, and, um, you know, I've been a euro skeptic for most of my career. I've always thought that the European Monetary Union is going to fall apart, uh, and it never has. Uh, and um, uh, I think um, uh, we saw very clearly uh, that um, the, um, uh, uh, the, the euro defied uh, the sovereign debt crisis in 2011. Uh, when the uh, president of the European Central Bank said, we'll do whatever it takes to defend the euro. And we've had a comparable moment uh, this year uh, when Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron uh, came together to basically establish a pan-European uh, 750 billion euro next generation EU fund, complete with the promise of a sovereign pan-European bond issuance. Uh, I think uh, Europe will come out of this uh, uh, extremely well. Uh, and uh, with respect to China, while the renminbi has been up uh, a lot uh, on a broad trade weighted basis uh, over the last uh, 15 years, I think if China stays the course of structural reforms and continues to open up uh, its um, um, uh, financial system, uh, there's room for further RMB appreciation as well. Um, also at work, though, is the fact that America is squandering uh, its global uh, leadership role. Leading the way in, in deglobalization, decoupling, trade protectionism, and then we failed miserably uh, at containing uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and of course, we have an unprecedented racial upheaval in the United States right now. If you look at this chart at the bottom, this compares new COVID uh, uh, cases, uh, the US, the blue line, Europe, the purple line. Uh, which currency would you want to own uh, if this is a proxy for relative performance uh, in dealing with public health issues? This chart, by the way, is up to date as of this morning. Uh, to say that um, America is... Um, uh, experiencing a problem uh, in containing uh, COVID-19 uh, is a gross 
uh, understatement, never, never mind uh, what our president uh, says. Um, and I guess the final point I would make is that um, uh, we do have a, uh, as a consequence of this um, uh, saving and, and de debt problem, uh, we're, we're going to quickly be in unprecedented territory with respect to our debt to GDP uh, ratio. This shows you public debt to GDP uh, uh, over a long sweep back to almost the, uh, the founding of the United States. The previous record was 106% uh, in 1946, post-World War II, and we're gonna probably hit 130% of GDP in the next few years. I'd point out that we, um, we uh, recovered from that debt overhang very sharply in the aftermath of World War II uh, by uh, cutting our, our, our annual accumulation of debt slightly, but largely by reflating our GDP with a combination of real uh, 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 GDP growth post-World War II, but also with accelerating uh, inflation. And that raises uh, the possibility that we may have to allow for more inflation uh, once we get out of this COVID crisis as well. And if that occurs at a time when we have a balance of payments, uh, a current account deficit that's at a record, we could have some funding problems that would entail uh, sharp increases in interest rates, reminiscent of the stagflation of the late 1970s. Um, I'm out of time, but I just need to touch on a couple of other things, and so bear with me. Uh, I'll do this very, very quickly. Um, and thinking about you know, the uh, the big events uh, that are likely to unfold over the balance of this year that will set the stage for the post-pandemic world, obviously our presidential election uh, is the, the top uh, uh, event risk to think about. The um, screenshot you see on the left with the O'Donnell and Associates uh, logo on the top uh, is a page taken from a strategy document that was prepared by uh, this group, O'Donnell and Associates, who is the uh, consultants, the strategy consultants for the Republican Party. They have produced a 57 page document published in mid-April called the Corona Big Book, which lays out uh, the US, uh, the Republican Party's election strategy. And their strategy is very simple. Um, when it comes to the virus, this is the big issue. And they're saying to their uh, party loyalists, do not defend Donald Trump, simply attack China. And that's because Trump is not defensible. I just showed you our horrible record on COVID containment. And so attack China for the virus uh, and for the cover up uh, and saying that uh, America did its best under the, the difficult circumstances. I've written about this. There's an article cited right below that uh, that I wrote with a good friend of mine, uh, Wei Jian Shan uh, of Hong Kong that uh, takes this argument apart. Uh, but I will tell you that the political debate uh, that uh, the O'Donnell strategy group has identified resonates very much with the American public where the unfavorable uh, ratings of China uh, on the right have never been higher. The case that um, the, uh, uh, the trade advisors make uh, for um, going after China uh, is that China, of course, has the largest um, trade deficit, the piece of the U.S. trade deficit. But as you can see from this very busy slide, China is but one of 102 countries we have trade deficits with. We have a multilateral problem that you cannot address by going after a, uh, a, a bilateral piece. Uh, the result of doing that is the trade diversion I showed you earlier. And, you know, we've done this before. In the late 1980s, we went after Japan, uh, and the, the purple bars show you that the Japan slice of our trade deficit was just as big as uh, 
the China slice is today. Uh, and uh, uh, Japan suffered greatly from the pressures that we brought to bear on them uh, by forcing them to overvalue uh, or to, to let their yen appreciate sharply. Uh, and uh, we've tried similar things with China, but knowing uh, the experience of, of uh, uh, Japan, China has not uh, succumbed to that uh, pressure. Uh, and then um, um, finally, I would just point out that you know we have this phase one trade deal that was struck just before the virus hit. Uh, and um, uh, the deal was a lousy deal from the start. It would not have accomplished much of anything. And you can see the progress that's been made thus far relative to the trajectory. Uh, this uh, uh, borrows from the work of Chad Bone of the Peterson Institute of International Economics. We're nowhere close to hitting uh, the stipulated uh, trajectory of um, uh, a phase uh, one. Uh, and so uh, I will leave you with um, this slide and then turn it over to the Q&A that um, this is likely to be an enduring conflict, uh, even um, uh, uh, if, if there is a change uh, in administrations from Republican to Democrat uh, in uh, January 20th, of uh, 2021. Uh, Cold War may not be the right label to call the uh, enduring conflict, uh, but um, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the pressure uh, between the US uh, and China is likely to be uh, an enduring uh, feature of this post pandemic world. And I would just draw your attention to the uh, table on the bottom right of this slide, uh, there's a perception in America that we're good at winning Cold Wars. Uh, we won the first one and we'll win the second one. And the point of this slide is that our economy is much weaker today than it was during Cold War 1.0 with the former Soviet Union. So, uh, uh, you know, I think th there's a, a, a lot uh, to digest as we move into the post-pandemic world, assuming we're ever able to get control over this horrific uh, virus. And I hope I've uh, uh, touched on at least some aspects of the scenario that you find of interest. And I will stop at this point. Thanks, Professor Roche, for the thought-provoking sharing. I'm Stephen Wong, uh, Deputy Executive Director and Head of Public Policy at uh, our Hong Kong Foundation. I'm your host uh, for the next session, uh, the Q&A session. Um, and so please, uh, if uh, we, we would invite uh, you to write questions uh, from, from you, from our guests, members of our Hong Kong Foundation, media and the public. And our first question, I would like to um, invite um, Professor Lawrence Lau, um, a world-renowned economist and previously the Vice Chancellor of Chinese University of Hong Kong. So please, uh, Professor Lau. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And uh, thank you, uh, the other Stephen, for a most uh, insightful and comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I really enjoy it. And I agree with you that there are two things that are the new normal. One is that the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, is going to the new normal. Uh, it might come up a second wave, perhaps a third wave, but I think other viruses will come. So we really have to be prepared. And, and this means we have to improve healthcare, healthcare infrastructure and services and maintain social distancing. This is a new normal. But the other new normal is what Steve also said, is that uh, the competition uh, between China and the US will also be a new normal. Sort of regardless of uh, the uh, change of, if there's any change in, of administration in November, it will be the new normal uh, for I think at least another decade or, or so. Um, so we have to be prepared. Be prepared. Um, I'm uh, optimistic that it will not turn out to be a, uh, a, 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 a hot ball, it, but, uh, but you know, it will actually uh, uh, be with us for a long time. Um, 
I actually want to ask Steve uh, the following question, which is an intriguing question, and that is about the devaluation of the U.S. dollar. As we all know, the U.S. dollar today uh, is actually uh, the most widely used international medium of exchange. And uh, I don't see on the horizon anything that might replace it in the short term. Um, but I want to ask Steve, uh, but I think what Steve said is absolutely right, that uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve Board has been printing <laughs> a great deal of money, and then there the debt, there's also a rising public debt, and, uh, and the falling savings rate, they are sort of interrelated. What I want to ask is, is actually the following, uh, Steve. Do you think this devaluation, uh, you know, expected devaluation, is going to come precipitously uh, all of a sudden, or whether it is actually going to come gradually over time? Um, so, that, so that is my short question uh, to Professor Roach. Thank you very much, Larry. That's a great question. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I think what we've learned uh, from this last few months is that COVID time moves at warp speed. Uh, you know, the world went from uh, solid growth to the weakest growth in history in a short period of two months. So I actually think that um, the dollar's um, sharp decline will be sooner rather than later uh, as our budget deficits explode before our very eyes uh, in the face of um, uh, an already weak savings rate. Uh, to your earlier point, though, I don't see this ending uh, the dollar's role as the dominant reserve currency in the world, however. I think that point is well taken. But there's a secular decline in uh, uh, official holdings of the dollar uh, 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 in terms of um, its share of foreign exchange reserves. In 2000, uh, the dollar accounted for a little over 70% of official foreign exchange reserves. Today, that number is a little bit less than 60. Uh, the next closest is the euro, uh, a little above uh, 20%. Uh, so the dollar is, um, uh, on a long-term basis, losing its share, but still uh, the dominant uh, 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 sort of source of, uh, of foreign exchange reserve holdings by central banks uh, around the world. That does not mean the dollar can't fall sharply, though. Uh, and uh, the dollar fell very sharply as I raced through my slides uh, in the 70s, again in the mid 80s, uh, and uh, in the early part of this decade as well. And I'm looking for that uh, uh, pattern to repeat itself uh, once more, even though it will still maintain its role for the time being as the dominant reserve currency in the world. Thanks, Professor. Thank <laughs> Thanks, Professor Roach. Um, may I invite the next question from Mr. Zhou Ai, uh, Managing Di uh, Partner of McKinsey Real China. He joined us this morning at our Hong Kong Foundation. Joe, please. Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, Professor Roach, thank you so much for a uh, very insightful uh, presentation and thank you for our uh, Hong Kong Foundation for putting this together. Um, I have a rather short question, um, but uh, but something that I'm very perplexed with. The one asymmetrical um, part that I'm seeing is basically the capital markets, right? So you're painting a rather grim view of kind of how this can pan out, much rather you know U-shaped or a prolonged kind of L-shape coming up gradually, but the V-shapes that we're seeing is actually in the capital markets, right? Apart from maybe two months, um, basically we are seeing a massive fee happening, right, in, in equities. Um, is that, you know, is that something that we'll see the asymmetrical between the economy and the capital markets? Um, or are we, you know, just like the, you know, the coronavirus, we can see different waves of, um, of the capital markets coming down. Um, or, or is the monetary uh, policies you know, having such a big effect 
right? That you know the decoupling between what we're seeing the stock market and the valuations of equities. Um, first, the real economy is kind of reaching something that will be a new normal for us. Thank you. Yeah, I was afraid I'd get a question like that. Um, you're you're entirely right. Um, the um, uh, global equity markets um, uh, have. Um, uh, very much demonstrated uh, an extraordinarily sharp recovery. For people who look at stock markets over a long period of time, whenever you see a drop, uh, the likes of which we saw in late March, and that was, again, extraordinary, uh, you would expect a recovery to ultimately uh, give way to a retesting of the um, late March lows. That never happened. Um, all I can say is, um, you know, I'm an economist. I'm not a, a stock market strategist, but uh, enjoy it while you can. Uh, because if, uh, if I'm right and the normalization on the uh, real economy side is likely to be asymmetrical, uh, and if this uh, statistical rebound that we will uh, that will be evident in the third quarter numbers gives way to uh, uh, a second downturn in the economy, uh, then the markets are totally unprepared for that and they will correct sharply again. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, other factors in play here. We've touched on some, uh, the U.S. election, uh, the currency outlook, uh, the monetary policy, uh, outlook um, uh, and even the outlook for uh, COVID mitigation through either therapeutics or uh, a vaccine. Right now, the markets, you know, the U.S. equity market was down a little bit today, but, you know, it was up very, very sharply uh, uh, over the, the last few months, much more sharply than literally anybody uh, was um, uh, looking for. It's got nothing but good news in the price. And so there's very little room for disappointment. Uh, and I think that's overly optimistic. Thank you for your question. Thanks, Professor Roach. And also, I would like to invite um, Mr. Elliot Wynn, General Manager of China Development Bank, Hong Kong branch. And he also joined us uh, at our Hong Kong Foundation this morning. Mr. Wynn. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor. It's my pleasure to take part in this forum and raise a question. Uh, my question is that uh, before and after this uh, post-pandemic, this pandemic, I think this uh, is totally different. We know that China's four decades of net-breaking development have arisen from demographic bonus, foreign investment, which came mostly from Hong Kong as an international financial center, and the WTO WTO access to the world market. With increasing risk of deglobalization and decoupling presently, along with fast aging population, China's future could be neg negatively affected by a likely decline in human resources, FDI, and access to the international market. Therefore, the Chinese government is increasing domestically demand by, for example, adopting an improved new infrastructure policy focused on seven areas, including 5G networks, intercity transportation, and the rail system. So my question is that, mindful of these risks, which, uh, how, how should foreign companies evaluate investment potential in the great, greater Bay Area, which including Hong Kong, Macau, and the Guangdong provinces? And what would you suggest to China's policymakers, including including the need for strengthening Hong Kong as an international financial center. Thank you. Well, there's a lot in there, and I will simply say that um, uh, it would be presumptuous of me to try to um, uh, offer advice to <clears throat> the People's Republic of China, which has done such an uh, extraordinary job uh, since the reforms and opening up uh, of the late 1970s. But I think this um, COVID shock just um, uh, underscores uh, 
uh, what we've known about China now for uh, quite some time. Uh, and that is that an economy that uh, drew such extraordinary support initially from um, uh, exports and increased uh, fixed investment um, in productive capacity uh, needed to come up with a new strategy. And this is a debate that's been going on in China since 2007. Uh, and um, uh, there's been, I think, great agreement inside of China that the need to shift from exports and investment uh, to uh, domestic demand, especially internal private consumption, uh, is increasingly urgent uh, for uh, China. Uh, and the uh, political and COVID-related threats to globalization and what this means for external demand makes uh, that reform imperative even greater today than it was back in 2007. So China needs to stay the course. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of strong political anti-China winds blowing in the world, but, um, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, strong winds uh, uh, that are blowing right now against China uh, will subside. And uh, I don't, like I said earlier, I don't think they're going to stop blowing even if um, there's a change in U.S. administration, but I, I'm hopeful they would be uh, less severe. The last thing China needs to do at this point is to alter its course and move away from the reforms uh, in terms of stimulating um, uh, internal private consumption, its services sector, focusing on indigenous innovation, uh, new waves of uh, uh, urbanization, including the greater Bay Area. All of that is, um, was on the books uh, and needs to uh, uh, continue. I'm hopeful in the same sense that uh, China recognizes the need to promote activity in its private sector, uh, to continue to focus on deleveraging, uh, and uh, to address uh, long overdue reforms needed in its state-owned enterprise sector. These are all uh, subjects that have been actively debated in China for well over a decade. And um, uh, I think China needs to stay the course. Thanks, Professor Roach. Um, there's a question from uh, South China Morning Post, a uh, friend from media. Um, Professor, you mentioned the recovery shape will be W shape. Does it apply to the whole global economy, or are there other economies that will escape from this uh, W shaped recovery? Are there any differences across the global economy uh, for this uh, shape of recovery? Yeah, look, there's. There's no way you want to generalize, you know, one letter of the alphabet <laughs> on 200 countries of the whole world. Um, and, and I don't even know if, it's, if a W is appropriate. All I'm suggesting is that uh, we went down more sharply uh, globally uh, in the second quarter of this year than the world has ever gone down in its history. Uh, and... Um, that was a deliberate uh, contraction caused by uh, the containment measures that we now know as, as a lockdown. As the lockdown gets eased, then statistically there will be a sharp uh, rebound. And so uh, the third quarter numbers will look better. I don't think we'll be able to sustain that statistical increase into the fourth quarter or even the first quarter of next year, even if we were not uh, going to have a, uh, a relapse, I think it would be hard to sustain that. If we have a second wave or a relapse in the virus, uh, then then it'll it'll be a very volatile bottoming process for the world with periodic uh, fits and starts uh, to uh, the recovery that'll be uh, manifested through equal volatility in uh, financial asset prices uh, as well. Some countries will do better than others, uh, but uh, to the extent that the world is very much interdependent, uh, 
these will have reverberations across all major economies of the world, including China. Thanks, Professor Roach. Uh, a question from Xinhua News Agency. Um, you talked about the decoupling between U.S. and China, um, potentially. But, uh, you know, with regards to the COVID-19, do you think there's any sort of opportunities of cooperation between U.S. and China to work together to recover the economy as well as to uh, in the face of the virus? There is enormous potential for collaborative work between China and the United States uh, to address the virus, to, to uh, engage jointly in uh, developing uh, therapeutics and research on vaccines. I wrote an article about this. It was published by Bloomberg um, uh, a few months ago, uh, and I was roundly criticized by my uh, friends and colleagues in the United States for saying that we have no desire uh, for collaboration. And yet, you know, I stand by my view. Uh, the pandemic, by definition, is global. It involves all major countries of the world. Uh, and China has done a remarkable job in containing uh, this horrible disease. We may not, in the United States, <coughs> um, be able to replicate uh, the types of uh, uh, severe practices that were put in place in China to contain uh, its initial outbreak of COVID-19. But there's so much we can learn in terms of the, uh, uh, again, the research uh, into the science of uh, uh, addressing the disease, the hope for a vaccine, the sharing of detailed data uh, uh, on the incidence of the virus by different demographic uh, uh, groups uh, that will help us uh, in understanding uh, the way in which this um, uh, horrible disease impacts uh, communities uh, and, uh, and, and, and countries. There's a lot that the U.S. and China can do to convene a consortium of leading scientists around the world, uh, leading public health officials around the world, Dealing with a pandemic is an opportunity for collaboration. Uh, and yet, if we try to address it on a fragmented basis, uh, we will um, uh, be running uphill. Uh, it's too much for any one country to do on its own. Thank you. Um, a question from Commercial Radio uh, in Hong Kong. And you mentioned that there is a sharp decline of the U.S. dollar uh, that is coming sooner rather than later in terms of timing. Um, and so uh, one is to confirm your view on that. And second is, uh, is my question, really, uh, that uh, obviously you mentioned that, um, you know, U.S. dollar dropped, uh, you know, by 30 percent in the 70s and 80s uh, before. So it's nothing new. But uh, in those period, it doesn't affect the status of the U.S. dollar as sort of the international uh, dominant currency. So my question then to you is, uh, you know, would this drop of 30% this time affect the status of the U.S. dollar as the dominant uh, world currency? Well, again, I tried to address that, but let me just make it clear. First of all, in terms of timing, I do think it'll be sooner rather than later. I think this is 35% uh, on a broad trade-weighted basis, uh, be the dollar against, uh, you know, a, a large group of our trading partners in inflation adjusted terms. And I think it will occur over the 20, uh, 20 to 2021 period. So within the next uh, um, year and a half. Um, secondly, I do not think, and I want to stress again, this will bring an end to the dollar's <laughs> dominance as the world's reserve currency. Um, but I think uh, uh, there, there's so much in the way of <clears throat> questionable per performance of our leadership role in the world, leading the charge against a globalization, uh, leading the way in uh, trade protectionism, arguing for uh, decoupling, uh, and then you know today announcing withdrawing from another global institution, the World Health Organization, heaven's sakes, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, we are, our performance as a 
global citizen can be um, drawn into serious question to say nothing uh, as being a global leader. We are not performing uh, in any way whatsoever uh, in the leadership capacity that the world has grown accustomed to expecting uh, from the United States. Does this lo lose our dominant role as the world's reserve currency? Not technically, but it certainly raises serious questions about whether or not we're deserving uh, of that role uh, in the future. And that's something that needs to be addressed uh, in our upcoming presidential election uh, and, and the administration that follows. And a follow-up question from Joseph is uh, care, also to specifically ask, care to comment on the time horizon of 35% fall in the US dollar and the possible triggers? Yeah, I think, um, Joseph, it's, uh, I would expect it, uh, the bulk of it to occur by the end of 2021, sooner rather than later. We're working on COVID time, which where things happen at warp speed. Trigger event, uh, again, budget deficits um, uh, and a uh, massive widening of our current account deficit. And I expect that to be far more evident uh, uh, in the, toward the end of, of 2020 and moving into 2021. So the numbers will bear that out and as, as, as the magnitude of our current account deficit becomes evident, uh, I think the uh, the weight of that will put uh, significant pressure uh, on um, the U.S. currency. Uh, and again, I, I draw your attention to the <coughs> chart I showed you on new COVID cases, um, the U.S. Uh, versus Europe. We're setting new records to the upside. Uh, in Europe, the numbers are close to zero. Which currency would you rather own uh, if um, uh, uh, we have uh, still problems with this pandemic moving into 2021. There are a number of questions uh, from the media, really, to invite Professor Roach to talk about Hong Kong, specifically uh, being caught in between a crossfire between the US and China tension, and uh, what is the potential impact on Hong Kong on various talks of sanctions, uh, on the various uh, uh, relationship issues between uh, China and U.S. and what would you, what would you be uh, your advice, your uh, your views on the development in the future, from a Hong Kong perspective? Well, I think you know I I, I was hoping you would say that um, we're out of time and so I don't have to answer <laughs> this controversial uh, question. There's there's no way I could answer that question without um, <clears throat> uh, causing controversy either you know in the United States or in Hong Kong but I will say the following um, the instability that was has been evident in the streets of Hong Kong over the past year was simply not sustainable uh, and those of you you know you, you you're Hong Kongers you know that uh, and so something had to give uh, and the Hong Kong government was not able uh, to control the demonstrations. And so <clears throat> there's now a, uh, a, a new uh, legal framework that is aimed at addressing it. It's not clear that will, um, that will work either. I am hopeful that the situation will be more stable uh, and that Hong Kong's long-term role as a major international center will not be as adversely impacted as some in the West uh, fear. Uh, U.S. politicians um, are taking advantage of what I showed you earlier, <coughs> uh, and I was too brief on it, in the Corona Big Book, and that is to blame China for everything. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, in a period where the Trump administration is in serious trouble, uh, not just for COVID, but for other issues. We haven't even talked about the racial unrest in the United States. Um, the, the Hong Kong issue will get highlighted even more uh, by partisan U.S. politics. And that's unfortunate, but that's the reality of our uh, uh, highly polarized uh, political climate in the United States. 
if I have succeeded in ducking the question, uh, <laughs> then, then I've accomplished my objective. Thank you. Uh, Professor Roach, uh, really, there are still a lot more questions, but given time, um, I wanted to thank you all those who sent in questions, as well as um, uh, thank you all the uh, uh, special guests that asked questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Stephen. And this concludes today's live webinar. Once again, thank you, Professor Roche, for sharing with us your valuable insights. There will be a group photo after the webinar, so please stay with us. Also, special thanks to all our supporting organizations. Our next Insight Forum session will feature Mr. Joseph Yam, who is the Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority from its establishment in 1993 to 2009, and is currently a member of the Executive Council of the Hong Kong SAR government. Mr. Yam will be sharing his insights on the outlook of Hong Kong as an international financial center. Please stay tuned for more information on our Hong Kong Foundation's main Facebook page and the Public Policy Institute's Jing Tat Zing Tat Facebook page. It's been a pleasure speaking in front of you today. Thank you all for joining. Stay healthy and have a great day.